exciting keynote on today. It was a, a big coup to get Dr. Melanie Price here this, this afternoon. Melanie Price, and I'm not going to read all this, but Melanie Price is an endowed professor of political science at Purdue and principal investigator for their African American Studies Initiative, funded from gifts from the Mellon Foundation. Her research teaching interests include black politics, public opinion, political rhetoric, and social movements. Now listen to her book titles. So they've, they've hired the correct person for African American Studies. Listen to these book titles. The Race Whisperer, Barack Obama and the Political Uses of Race, Dreaming Blackness, Black Nationalism, and African American Public Opinion, and lastly, Mountaintop Removal, Martin Luther King, Trump and the Racial Mountain. Now, only an African American studies connoisseur would have titles such as this. Dr. Price completed her Bachelor of Arts, Magna Cum Laude, in Geography at Purdue University. She completed both her Master's and PhD degrees in Political Science at Ohio State. Before coming to Prairie View, she was an Associate Professor of Africana Studies and Political Science at Rutgers University. She previously taught at Wesleyan University, and she's also worked on election commentary for the 2016 election season, Philadelphia's NBC. I present to you Dr. Melanie Price. Uh, 
a, a hip hop song that was my ringtone, and I took it off, and my, so my mother said, well, you finally matured, you don't have this hip hop ringing on your phone no more, and I said, really, it just came ringing in front of Ruth Simmons, I don't care about the rest of those people. <laughs> Who else hear it? She cannot hear that. Anyway. But as most of you know, I have come home to facilitate the process of building an African American Studies program. I truly believe that Prairie View can be a model for how African American Studies scholarship and the collection of African American artifacts and papers can be incorporated into the larger mission of historically black colleges. In this era, we are called to do more than educate black students, but to, serious, but to take seriously our traditional role as the guardians of black culture and the intentional producers of black leadership. Right, the intentional producers, I wanna actually say quality black leadership. We need to take that now, more serious now, more than ever. We will do that by doing a couple of things. Highlighting, producing, and publishing black-centered scholarship that tells a robust and humane story of the black presence across the globe. I want to make that clear. Highlighting, producing, and publishing. This will be a, um, a program where its scholars will be productive scholars by creating a set of courses that touch all of our students and give them the tools to critique imbalances of power based on race, class, and gender, and other categories, and to help them learn the skills that will allow them to dismantle those systems that hold these imbalances in place. And the last thing we're gonna do is we're gonna boost our capacity to preserve, collect, and showcase physical artifacts of our history, papers, photographs, films, and other forms of material culture that help us understand who we are. And I would like to spend a bulk of my time talking about the thing that I've spent most of my career doing, if you don't mind, and that is talking about racial politics and black politics more specifically. You have caught me in a really interesting um, moment in my life where uh, my worlds collide, where I'm the most American of all, and that is presidential seasons and the Olympics. And those things are slowly easing together where it's the only thing I, I'm like, yes, America, in those moments. And so right now that we have this presidential election going on, I thought it would be worth it to talk a little bit about politics today, if you um, indulge me. If you disagree with my politics, I'm fine, it actually happens all the time. You'd be surprised how you put one thing in the paper and people are happy to send you an email about what an idiot you are. Like literally, they will say, you are an idiot. You, specifically, are, like, you'd be surprised, baby. That's a nice email. Okay. So it's fair to assume that the vast majority of us would agree that the nation is at a dangerous yet familiar point in its racial history. The level of open and explicit racial hostility is at the highest it's been since the 1960s Civil Rights Movement. Membership in racist hate groups is at an all-time high, Vigilante violence and racially charged police shootings are almost a daily occurrence on our news programs. The President of the United States uses his bully pulpit to foment hatred and violence against all people of color via Twitter, and we have seen him openly insult and excoriate black women reporters and black women politicians. For the first time ever, I find this a very funny statistic, so I'm gonna prime you with that. For the first time ever, the majority of white survey respondents said that they believe that they are victims of racial discrimination. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, their whiteness is hurting them. And they want you to know. If you start in with that barbecue Becky and corner store Caroline and Permit Patty and Starbucks uh, managers calling the police for sitting while black, anyone would be overwhelmed. With the seeming cost of the, the seemingly high cost of living while black, we are all stressed. I don't know about you, but I am. Everybody in my household is stressed. Up. We have almost all taken to just not watching the news, which is a terrible thing for an informed citizen to do. But I think some of you uh, would understand me. I recommend NPR because, at the very least, they don't yell. Anyway. But our students are feeling this uh, along with us, and they are feeling 
it along with acute, an acute awareness that there is a chance that their generation, for the first time in history, will do worse economically than their parents, which is something that has never happened in the United States. And they're going to be doing this while likely being saddled with higher student, student loan debt than ever before. I want you to listen to that. Your children, your grandchildren, will be the first generation in America to not do better than the generation before them. Some of y'all already know this because, you know, your children live with you, and as I heard earlier, <laughs> somebody in here might have told you that I live with my mom. <laughs> I keep telling her that I pay rent. <laughs> I don't live with my mama, she's my landlord. <laughs> and she likes to tell her, my mother's like, I'm not your landlord, you live with me until you need to get out of here. Don't, don't plan living with me into your budget for life. This is not, this is not forever. I was like, wait a minute. I mean, I love it, but apparently. You know, this hostile racial climate um, has us all stressed out. I mean, I, I don't encourage people to indulge in vices, but if you got some, now I would say it's not the time to stop indulging in those vices, because we are all stressed out. You are, uh, many of you in this room who are older than me watch the news and see debates happening that you thought had been solved years ago. You had sat in and boycotted and marched to help solve some of these problems. I sh I'm sure you are watching this and it feels like the reboot of a very tragic drama of, because of the lessons that you thought we had learned more than a generation ago. As African Americans, we know that the problems of the 1960s were never completely solved, but we felt like we had a sense that there had been enough progress that we would not return to this. But as we move into another presidential season, it is, it is incumbent upon us to think about the role that we as individuals and we as members of a collective organization can play as we try to push against some of the problems that are currently arising. I'm going to offer a set of arguments about why I think the president and the Republican Party is um, engaged in the kind of political strategy that it is engaged in now. I think part of it is because they are trying to prevent changing, the changing demographics of this country to be felt in the halls of power. As a democracy that is governed by the people for the people and where the majority rules, it is clear that the coming brown majority is set to displace whites as the face of American, as the face of American power unless there can be ways to prevent it. This while this prospect, prospect excites me greatly, I'm very excited about brown in America. I mean, it just sounds real great to me. Like people everywhere would look like me. I don't know why anybody would want that. <laughs> I feel like other people have experienced it before and maybe we can have a chance to get some of that too. So while this prospect is, excites me greatly, the rise of white nationalist movements, that's what they call them now, but AKA is just regular racist movements, is in direct response to this fear of displacement. They will tell you that their slogan is make America great again, but I find myself often asking great when, great for who, great how, great in what way. Now that's not to say that we, that, that is not about African Americans' love for America. Black Americans have demonstrated over and over again their commitment to the American Democratic Project at times when it was costly to do so and at times when it was not appreciated by the larger American public. I find myself often telling my students that the best days for black America are always the ones ahead when we have another chance to make this country a more equitable and hospitable place that look for, for people who look like us. If you look at both state and federal, at, at the state and federal level, you will note that there are three strategies that are being used to prevent the browning of power in America. And these issues are all interrelated and connected to citizenship. 
I'm going to talk briefly about the first two, and then the third one, I think, deals directly with Prairie View, and I'm going to bring us into that story. So, first, there is an effort to get rid of what is called birthright citizenship, a right enshrined in the Constitution that says anyone born on American soil is an American. This is something that we just have come to expect. You're born in America, you are American. There are groups and politicians who are seriously asking whether being born in America makes you an American. Outside of the naturalization process, it is the only other measure of the thing that makes us a collective body. We are Americans because we were either naturalized or we were people who were born on American soil. There are those who would say that this is not enough. This does not rise to the level of citizenship. I'm not going to talk a lot about it, but I am going to offer you something that you might want to read that might help you. Martha Jones, who is a historian at, the, at Johns Hopkins University, has a wonderful new book called Birthright Citizenship that talks about all of this. It's very accessible and actually you know, pretty interesting. So she can talk to you all about the ways that birthright citizenship was a thing that allowed, it is a thing that allowed newly freed, uh, newly emancipated black citizens to become Americans because they were born on American soil. Now that was fought out in other ways, but it's important to know. The second thing, uh, effort that they are engaged in is stemming the tide of immigration. I know I'm in Texas. I know immigration is sometimes tricky. I know we tend to think of immigration as an issue that is solely related to our Spanish-speaking brothers and sisters, but we have to also consider the ways that we have black immigrants in this country. And interestingly, this comes at a point where illegal immigration in this country is relatively stagnant. There simply aren't the hordes of people who are trying to illegally cross the border as, you, as they would have you believe. It's simply not true. The levels are not higher than they were 10 years ago. They are about the same. The levels are the same. The way they gin up the problem is different. The problem, I would argue, is not who is coming across the border, but where they are coming from and what they look like. When immigrants came from European countries um, that could be assimilated more easily into whiteness, we erected a giant statue of liberty with a sign that said, give me your tired, your poor, your huddle masses yearning to be free. The wretched refuse of your teeming shores. Send these, the homeless, tempest tossed to me. I, I lift the lamp beside my golden door. You remember that. Some of you have been to the Statue of Liberty. You have seen it. Some of you learned to recite it in elementary school. Now the bulk of those same immigrants who were largely illegal. Look around at these new immigrants from Asia, Latin America, Africa. Those same huddled masses turn around and shall build a wall. One of the reasons they're doing that is because they believe that these immigrants of color are going to become Democrats. They believe that they are going to vote them out of office. And so they don't want immigration to stand because they don't want them to become citizens. Now the third thing that they're doing, I think is closer to us at PV, and that's about voter suppression and disenfranchisement. If it were not for voter suppression efforts, right now we would be still in the glory days of celebrating Governor Stacey Abrams of Georgia, Governor Andrew Gilliam of Florida, and Senator Beto O'Rourke of Texas. Despite voter suppression, black people continue to return to the polls. African American women in particular are the highest voting demographic in the country. They turn out more than anyone else. So African American women in the room, give yourself a pat on the back because really, y'all put the whole lot in office. Y'all put all Democrats in office. I guess maybe not Democrats in Montana, but if Democrats would have let people, let women help put them. In 2013, the Supreme Court undid 50 years of work to protect minority voting rights in a case called Shelby v. Holder. What they did actually was take away pre-clearance, and pre-clearance is a protection which required all states covered under the Voting Rights Act to get permission before they change the rules related to their voting process. That is, before you change the rule, you had to run it by the Justice Department. The Justice Department would say, no, because this is the same racist stuff you were doing before the Voting Rights Act, and we must stop you. 
Now, there's nothing in place that requires them to do so. And so states like our very own state, the state of Texas, had legislative legislation waiting. That required state-issued IDs that you have to pay for. And as a person who just moved here from another state, the difficulty of sitting in that driver's license place and getting, what, well, well, finding the driver's license place and then the difficulty of getting it. Imagine a person with no resources, with no car, trying to figure out how to get a state-sponsored ID. It's very difficult and discriminatory. They shortened early voting in many places because one of the things they found in 2008 and 2012 is that Barack Obama had already won largely because he had had so many of his supporters vote early. And so what they decided to do was just get rid of early voting. So all of those people, literally, they shortened it. And they decided that because your county, where you were, was not having early voting, then no counties in some states could have early voting. They made voter registration drives illegal, and so some of you will remember, and some of you have also participated in putting tables outside of grocery stores and libraries and signing people up to register to vote. In many states, you cannot do that without a permit, or you can be prosecuted. Then, then they are purging the names from the voting rolls, and they're doing this in various ways. One of the ways they're doing it is they've just decided that if you didn't vote in the last election, then they're just assuming you're not going to vote in this election, and they are taking your names off the polls. They are using faulty lists to take your name off the voting polls. So if your name is Joseph Jones, and there was a Joseph Jones who was a felon, say Joseph A. Jones, Joseph F. Jones, Joseph Q. Jones, Joseph D. Jones, any other Joseph Jones gets kicked off. So some of y'all with those very common names, you should really think about this. They are using machines that have no backup process for recording votes. That is, once you register your vote, we have no way to understand whether or not it is actually accurately counted. There are also random mailings that intimidate voters, notices that go out that tell people that their polling places have changed, that the dates of elections have changed. Then there's the fake news from Russia. There's a refusal to restore voting rights to formerly incarcerated citizens who have served their time. All of these things are things that are currently helping, currently happening, that are trying to present, prevent us from participating in our rightful place in the electoral system. I want to say, I have a very good quote from Ruth Bader Ginsburg from Shelby that I think helps illustrate this. She says, the sad irony of the Shelby decision lies in its utter failure to grasp why the Voting Rights Act has proven effective. Throwing out preclearance when it has worked and is continuing to work to stop discriminatory changes is like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you are not getting wet. I love that. It's like Supreme Court shade. It's like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you are not getting wet. What is very important about that decision as well, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg's dissent, she points out examples of discriminatory uh, behavior. And one of those examples she offers is, in 2004, Waller County, Texas, threatened to, to prosecute two black students after they announced their intention to run for office. The county then attempted to reduce, to reduce the availability of early voting in that election and in that, in that election at polling places near a historically black university. She's talking about us. She is telling our story and the story of this. Prairie View is important to this voting history. Our students fought to have access to the vote in the location where they live for the majority of the year. In 1979, some of you were there during those years in the 1970s where Prairie View students were fighting to vote in Prairie View. So some of you are familiar with the Sims versus U.S. case where the Supreme Court decided that Prairie View students should be able to have a say in the politics of Waller County and that students all across the country could vote where they went to college. Any student who gets to vote where they went to college owes the people in this room, particularly those of you who were there in the 1970s, a great debt. But we know that county officials have continuously worked to prevent our students from voting in every election. 
while I was there as an undergrad in 1992 and participating in my first presidential election, 19 PV students were indicted for voter fraud. This has happened several times since. We are also aware of the current ongoing litigation our students are engaged in from the 2018 election. And there are many other stories. Some of you who were not there for these particular years probably have their own stories about the difficulty of getting the vote, about being turned away at the polls, about other kinds of problems. I have been thinking about sort of mulling over a series of things that I think our alum and our alumni association can do a better job at of helping our students in the voting process. I should say, not it. I'm going to offer you these suggestions, and then I'm not going to be, be the person who is going to try to help you implement them. I'm just going to do my job, and I'm going to offer this to you. So let me just say that right now. No, not me, but other people. Just in case you were like, yeah, let's join. No, not me. We already know that something untoward, something fishy, there will be shenanigans. We know all of these things are going to happen in 2020. We know it. We have no doubt that it's coming. Right now, I would like to suggest that there are several things that our alums and our alumni association can be doing to help in that process. Right now, I think we should be planning. We should be identifying lawyers who are alums of the university, who are allies of the university, who will be on call for these students. We know election day is coming. It's more than a year away. We should have people ready at the waiting for these students. I think we should be in touch with the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund and be proactive about steps we can take to make sure that our students get to engage in the most basic right of all citizens, and that is the right to vote. It should not be the case that one of the signature moments in your prayer in your life is trying to march to Hempstead to fight voting rights cases. We should not be doing that in every election, and I think there's a way that the alumni association can help in that. We should start a legal advocacy team. We should start a legal advocacy team and fund this team for our students where it hires lawyers and other legal experts who can help them. We know that voting indictments are not the only way that Waller County government uses its power discriminatorily over our students. It shows up in discriminatory traffic stops. It shows up in basic interactions with law enforcement. It shows up in their relationship to landlords. It shows up in them just walking down the street. It shows up in them having parties and who decides to call the police. It shows up in all of these things. And that is because the government feels like it can do whatever it wants to its students. It is incumbent upon us to say that we are watching. And not just watching, but we are saying that you cannot do this. We have to stop. We have to stop treating these things as unrelated to a larger political debate over the degree of voice Prairie View and its students have over the politics of the county. So when our students get stopped or profiled, we should have a number that they can call that leads them to an actual people who can help them so that their lives are not derailed by the kinds of minor infractions white kids are also engaged in. I've spent 15 years teaching at predominantly white campuses. I will tell you that there is nothing that I've ever seen at Prairie View that I haven't seen a white student do three times over. I worked at a school where a kid had a pill mill in his dormitory. He was not arrested. He was not indicted. He is not in jail. The university handled it internally, or his parents got a lawyer. And I'm saying we know that our students cannot afford lawyers. We know that they cannot afford these things. And it is our job to figure out how not to let the law enforcement system to catch them up. We should have a number for our students so when they see their neighbors and fellow students being taken into custody, there is someone they can call. And that person is at the ready. But not just to notify them but also to have lawyers prepared who will show up to advocate for our students. We should commit ourselves to never having another Sandra Bland again. And the way we do that is we have our students aware that when something happens, they can call.
call somebody who has resources available to help advocate for them. We want, when someone is taken into custody, for them to be able to call a hotline and say, this person has been taken into custody, and we say, we don't know what they did, and we're not going to judge, and we're not going to take sides. What we're going to do is we're going to send a lawyer to ask a question. And I guarantee you, the more you do that, the less the law enforcement agencies will be predatory towards our students, and we won't be, you know, using fees and tickets and other things to feed them. When our students, yeah, when our students, the next thing I think we should do is when our students have to protest, when they take to the streets to advocate for themselves, there should be people in our alumni, in our alumni association who lets the entire alum know. That way, those of us who are in driving distance can drive there. Those of us who would like to, can't come, but would like to send money can find ways to support them. Also, we can identify who we should be calling and writing letters to, to complain. I would like to see a political onslaught in Waller County. I would like to see that led by this alumni association. But none of this can happen unless we begin to see our students as people who are on the receiving ends of a discriminatory system and not the way others would have us portrayed. If you look at the news in Houston, you would think that our students are criminals. You would think that our students are somehow behaving in ways that other college students do not. We cannot let that be our narrative. Our narrative should be, I don't care what they did, they need a lawyer. I don't care what they did, they need support. We'll figure out the rest later. But first, let's not let a random traffic stop be the thing that derails our students. Let's not let the image of our students as loud, belligerent, genetically criminal be the thing that stands. We have to see our students as ourselves when we were there and offer them the support and protection we would have wanted. There are times when I know you ended up in traffic court in Hempstead, and you ended up in a dispute with your landlord in Waller, and you would have liked an adult with some authority and some expertise to step in and help you to step in and ask questions that your 18-year-old, 19-year-old, 20-year-old 20 20 self might be too afraid to ask at a time when you also might be too afraid to call your mama. <laughs> and so we handled a lot of problems ourselves in ways that could have been done better because we couldn't call our moms, we wouldn't call our moms and dads, and we were not sure enough of ourselves to ask the right questions. We can be those adults for them. We can be that person. We have uh, over one year to plan and prepare to support our students to exercise their voting rights act, and exercise their voting rights. This is a fight without a discernible, um, without a discernible end, and largely because the people, the power structure within Waller County is committed to trampling on our students' rights. It's like it must be in the top of their motto. Their motto must be at voting season. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to mess with those students at Prairie View and then we'll figure out how everybody else can vote. But this is the first thing that we're going to do. And what we're going to do is we're going to tell our students that they are not alone in learning to be good American citizens. We are going to help them do that. With the students' willingness to stand up and be counted in every election and an alumni an alumni association that is willing to use its collective power to exert pressure on those that would hinder our students. We can secure rights for our students in Waller County. We can change their relationship to voting in the federal government. And we can do so and follow in the footsteps of our students, of the students who secured the voting rights for students across the nation. Thank you. Dr. Melody Price, political science and Dow professor, Prairie Native University class of 1995, in appreciation for your willingness to serve as our guest speaker during the Panther Luncheon. Thanks, thank you. Uh, well, now, I uh, wanted to make
make sure I got back up here. After hearing that speech, uh, and I wanted to hear it first before I make a comment, but I, after reading her resume, basically, and the title of the book, uh, I wanted to hear the speech. And I, I think uh, the newly formed African American Study uh, team group that she's going to be heading is in awesome, awesome hands. Let's give her another round of applause. Thank you, Sister President, to make sure that we say something. African-American women, as she stated in her speech, are on the rise and have been doing what you guys have been doing for centuries. For centuries. And so, African-American women, give yourself another hand. Some of you were at the general meeting yesterday and I told you there was no man, no father in my house. So, African American women, I want you to understand something as I speak these words. There are a number of men in this room who are solid black men. Give them a hand. I have seen black men do what we do without appreciation for you, not taking anything away from my women. Thank you for what you do. But do not ever forget, there are a number of black men who do what we do, raise our children, handle our business, and don't get the credit. I'm sorry, I almost got it most. <laughs> we will then have our uh, announcements by our uh, parliamentarian, or what, but come on. Historian. <laughs> Historian. <laughs> Forgive me. Well, it's a pathway, right, because this weekend I am here as parliamentarian in the absence of the <laughs> Freddie Roberts uh, for you know, the previous engagement. However, as you mentioned, I am Donna Glover. I am the historian for your National Alumni Association, class of 1998. Uh, if you would take a look at your workshop uh, booklets, our books, you would notice that our next sessions are as follows. The uh, executive session for the Office of Development, and that's going to be in the Springwoods Village One Ballroom. That's at 2 p.m. We, we almost there. Very good. <laughs> you guys know the history of this association. We're doing good. Uh, compliance training for NAA chapter presidents and treasurers, mandatory attendance. That's in Springwoods Village Two Ballroom, 2:30 p.m. And our uh, Fairview a and Foundation will be presenting at 3.30 p.m. today at the Pine Ball uh, Board room, excuse me. We hope that you are a, a enjoying the convention so far. Don't forget to stop by the vendors. We have some great vendors out there. What do you guys think? I know you passed by them already, but it takes a lot for them to get set up. Uh, and to be here, so we want to make sure that we're patronizing them. Also, as you guys know that I'm an avid athletic supporter, and so we have our athletics table set out there, so if you need to get your season tickets, please do so after this, excuse me, and make sure that we're supportive of our university. Go Panthers. I know we've been sitting for a long time, so let's go ahead and stand. Let's go ahead and stand. <clears throat> now go into the world in peace. Have courage on all men, on all women. Strengthen the faint hearted 
and support the weak. Help the suffer and share the good news abroad. And may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ be with us all until we meet again. And the church at prayer, you said, Amen. Amen.